Did you notice the it's intro's happening. weird? Did you notice yeah. how some of them oh, have... it's not too weird, though. I mean, no, but I lost the intro, and then I had to re-upload it, and when I did, then, like, now they all have this, like, weird black frame around them, and I'm all... I don't care for that, but... Hmm. This was literally, like, it's ten minutes intro. ago, so I didn't have time to try to fix it, but I'll figure it out maybe for next time, or I'll just leave it. I can do what I want. I'm all, I think that's just how it is now. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, that's life, right? Like, okay, everything's shrunken and weird. Okay, we're just rolling with it. Let's just do that. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. So, hi, guys. Welcome to History of a Haunting. I am Carrie. And I'm Laura. And we, uh, <laughs> wow, thought right out of my head. And right. we're on YouTube, right. so the viewers we watched it. We do a podcast. <laughs> right? The viewers watched the thought just poof, right out of my head. <laughs> um, well, let's just jump right into the EVPs then, Laura. We, as always, um, do a little bit of endless vocal prattling to kick off the show, lose some of our listeners. Uh, <laughs> if you guys want to skip ahead, that's fine. But we do have some fun information to talk to you about, so maybe you just stick around. Um, we do want to, as always, and is going to be the case, where are we going in May? Everybody knows it together. Spirit Con! Yay! May 19th through the 20th, 2023. Come out and see us. It's going to be a really good time. I'm super excited for this one. And Laura and I get to investigate the St. Augustine Lighthouse. <gasps> it's going to be so much fun. I'm excited for that one. I'm excited That'll for that one. Super fun. That'll be super fun. We are also, um, Southern Entities Paranormal is teaming up with our BFFs, Piedmont Paranormal Investigation and Research, and Spirits of the Southeast to investigate the USS North Carolina in Wilmington. And that's going to be July 30th. So in just a few weeks, um, we are going to go and investigate private overnight investigation of a fucking battleship. I have never been on a battleship, let alone investigated one. So, um, some like Chris and Audra have went down there and they've toured it. Uh, Connie has toured it. Everybody's like, watch your head, watch your step. It's really cramped space. Like, so it's going to be, I think that one's going to be really interesting. I'm really looking forward to that one. Have you ever toured a battleship or anything like that? Did you do the. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I stayed on an aircraft carrier for one of Zane's. Oh, that's um, right. Like Boy Scout things out in um, Texas. Yeah. Um, in uh, Corpus Christi. And then, which was, yeah, it's not that fun as an adult. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's all right. Um, and then we did the submarine in San Francisco, the one that's off... Uh, the wharf there mm -mm, submarine no. and then there's another ship behind it so we did both of those when we went to san francisco mm. last year um aren't you a little claustrophobic before, but really is it really bad i am um i could never have been on like stayed on one of those ships especially the submarine with like mm -hmm. yeah just people piled on top of each other, especially under the water. Oh, fuck no. <laughs> no. You know, but the it is still in the water, so it's funny, like, because it moves, you know, like mm -hmm. they sway because they're right. in the water. Right. Um, I mean, not a lot, but enough that you feel it. And it's, yeah, kind yeah. Of disconcerting <laughs> be the word that I would use. You know, they thought it was awesome. Of course he did. <laughs> but, of course he did. Yeah. 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 So yeah. kids, yeah, kids love that kind of stuff. It's really cool. Um, I'm curious to see how your EVPs and stuff come out because of the movement and the sounds and the echoes and that the, it's a huge occur. metal 
entirely metal. Yeah, I'm I'm curious about that as well. The other thing we were talking about is using our FLIR cameras, which mm. I can't remember where they were at, but um, Ghost Hunters captured a really interesting um, anomaly using a thermal camera. And I it was against... A, a, on a locker and you could clearly mm. make out like a human shape that was wearing like a cap but everything is kind of and that's what chris and audra and and connie donnie donna and connie um we're just gonna call them donnie uh mm-hmm. so what connie said is that a, a lot there's a lot of reflective surfaces on the ship Right. So, be, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty interesting as far as like um, any interesting photographs that we may cap that we may capture. Um, certainly, the FLIR is going to be something that I don't know as I'll use simply because you and I know firsthand how a FLIR could capture a reflection, even like all the way down a hallway. Um, so I don't know. It's going to be, it's definitely going to be a challenge and I'm really looking forward to it. And it's just, this ship is, is massive. It's massive. And I think about, they said about 25 to 30% of the ship we have access to, which is a lot because this thing is huge. So, right. Yeah. So that is, um, that investigation is coming up Saturday, July 30th. So we will certainly talk about that in a recap episode. Laura is unable to make it to this one, guys. So it's just going to be me, Chris, and Audra repping the Southern Entities um, paranormal team. Um, But, Laura, why don't you tell them where we're going to be going in August? Right. But I am able to make it to Gettysburg. Yay! Yeah, the Gettysburg. So bash. that's exciting. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. I've never been to Gettysburg. Um, Me either. Me I've either. never really spent any time in DC, so I'm just flying in and leaving. But <laughs> I am so excited, and <laughs> I'm very happy to go check out Gettysburg mm-hmm. and to go to the to the con and to do all the things. That'd be awesome. Do uh, my all cat the is. D- yeah. He, you know, he has learned how to open doors. Kind of. <laughs> oh, that's right. You don't let him in immediately. He starts pulling on the handle to be like, "Okay, hold. everybody, hold." Come on. <laughs> he's don't dawdle. <laughs> he gave you some lip. <laughs> all right, everybody. He's gonna jump up on our lap in a minute and then show all of us his butt. That's <laughs> pretty much how it goes. So, yeah, he. Um, this is his new fun thing. So his impatience to be let in to any room um, <laughs> is now preceded by loud banging while he's trying to pull the handle. Well, the there's the tail. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little bit. That's he's so needy. I mean, um, so, so needy, <laughs> but yeah. So I'm super excited to go to do the Gettysburg and I, this is my first real um, Paracon. <sighs> You know what? It is mine, too. I did go to Con Carolinas down in Charlotte at the beginning of June, but that was not strictly a paranormal convention. So I'm really looking forward to Mm -hmm. this. Our friends, Anthony Simonelli, who was on the show, the recap show with us, along with Scott Reddick. Anthony's going to be there with his team, Seekers Club of the Paranormal. They're going to be they're going to have a vendor booth there. And then. Author Sam Baltrusis, who is also a friend of ours, he's going to be there as well. And I do believe Dave Schrader of the Holzer Files is going to be there as well. So we've got a lot of, yeah, we've got a lot of folks to go there and to see and support. We're not going there as guests or our vendors or anything like that. We're going to be attendees just like everybody else. And Laura and I are going to, you know, check out some of the booths and get some ideas for our own um paranormal convention tour next year um and i'm calling it a tour laura because we're probably gonna try to do at least three or four of them i would imagine throughout the year so it's a tour uh, yeah I, think, I believe that is the we're going on tour woo woo oh um <laughs> could you imagine if we did live shows how fucking obnoxious i'd be <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> also for panelists at any of these conventions yikes guys for real 
Um, nothing I love better than a fucking live audience. <laughs> Stand up and listen to me, chat. A captive audience if Cap- you can get one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thousand percent. Um, yeah, so we're going to go to Gettysburg. It's going to be a lot of fun. My mom is coming with us, too. So the live studio audience is going to be with us in Gettysburg. She's not going to do the more haunted stuff. Um, she is going to go to the convention with us. She's really looking forward to that. And Chris and Audra are going to be there. And our friends Jody and Lisa from Mid-Atlantic Day Trips are going. It's going to be a really great time. So we'll probably try to do some Facebook Lives from the convention. Maybe throw up some TikToks. And yeah, so I'm excited for that. For sure, for sure. And then you, Little Miss, had a special shout out, didn't you? Yeah, so my um, friend Caroline Wright, Miss Wright, as I like to call her, um, (laughs) who does my... Uh, has been doing my tattoos um, and has done a bunch of them. She just opened her, her like real shop uh, this past weekend. I went to the grand opening. So I'm so excited for her. And that's great. You know, a few other really cool artists that are out there. So it's sound. If you're in Phoenix, um, it's sound sanctuary tattoos. Okay. And she's amazing. And she's so nice and wonderful. And she's actually going to be doing some collaborations with us here um, on some merch pretty quick. So yeah, um, she is awesome. So if you are in need of ink and you live in the Phoenix area, go check her out. She's great. Where is the shop at? It is off the 101 and I believe like Baseline. So it's like Mesa-ish. Oh, Mesa okay. Border. Oh, whoa. Yeah, it's that's over by like my old Mesa house. Border. Yeah, that's over by my old house. Yeah. That's cool. So it's, that is yeah, really it's cool because cool it is right off the freeway. Yeah, I'm just so happy for it. So that's awesome. That's wonderful. Yay. Okay. So Caroline Wright, and you said it was Sound Sanctuary Tattoos? Mm-hmm. Hey, Sound check me out tattoos. remembering shit. Right? Um, look at you go. Look at me go. Yeah, so please go check her out. Laura, some of Laura, the tattoos that she's done for Laura are really amazing. Can you show them the bull? Yeah, that one. The bull in the china cup, the little china teacup. That's a really great one. Mm. The detail on it is is beautiful, and I love the meaning behind it, which it's for her son, Zane, who's like a bull in a china shop, so. Um, <laughs> which is what my grandmother always used to call me, too. <laughs> God, can't you like a bull and in a china shop? the reason my mom used to call me that, and I know that she would be saying that about Zane, or probably is from wherever she is, the great beyond. So, uh, yeah, like I hear her voice, <laughs> saying it so yeah yeah it's really nice it's, it's really yeah. appropriate and i love that and everything so it's perfect oh so it is perfect yeah <laughs> um so yeah okay great and then the last uh evp that i wanted to share with you guys is my art business is now kind of thing and I have, um, because it is tied in with the podcast, because everything I do is tied in with the podcast, it all circles back to my baby history of a haunting. Um, I have started my art business, and it is called Words Are Hard Artistry by Carrie. So um, I have a Facebook page. Come on over. Um, Words Are Hard Artistry is the Facebook page. And, you know, I'm posting all of the new art that I'm doing and photos of it kind of being done. I know that a lot of folks really like to watch the art being made. I am trying to figure out how to do that. Um, And if I want to do that, I'm just really starting out. But for um, you guys who are interested, I don't have an Etsy shop. I'm not going to have an Etsy shop. Nothing like that. Uh, my shop is the podcast website. So for more information or to place an order, come on over and visit hoahpodcast.com slash shop. And thank you, Carrie. Uh, <laughs> there's a kiss. Um, so yeah, uh, words are hard. Artistry is a is a living, breathing thing now. And uh, my office is rapidly becoming the UPS store. Uh, because I have sold several paintings now. Yeah. Um, I've sold several paintings now. And so I'm shipping out orders and and things like that, um, have made some gifts for folks. Uh, Zane is one of them. His is being shipped out, uh, this week before I go to Pittsburgh. My beautiful niece, Emma just graduated high school and her big party is this Saturday. So Koi and I are headed back up to Pittsburgh, um, for the party. So I'm going to ship all this out before I leave. Um, 
and uh, Mr. Zaniacs is is one of those that I'm sending. So um, that's if, awesome. Yeah, and actually, let me show everybody Zanes. So hang on, yes, I'm really proud of it. <laughs> it turned out way better than I thought that it would. Um, uh -huh. Well, I've seen it. It really is cool. Um, yeah. And you know, Carrie needs help to cover her paint costs. Yeah, it's super cool. So it's like tie dyed with a big Z in the middle. Yeah. Um, so it's really cool. He loves like rainbow and colors and whatever. So bright colors. So yeah. um, I'm getting ready to redecorate his bathroom and that is going to go in there. And then um, so I'm excited. It's going to make it, you know, very yeah. personal. I'm excited to nice for him. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm really pleased with how it turned out and it's so bright and vibrant. There's like awesome. iridescent gold throughout and it's covered. This one is covered in resin, which is why it's so shiny. Um, so yeah, my paintings are covered in resin or gloss varnish. Um, this one Jennifer wants. This is one of my favorites. Oh, that's yeah, that's cool. So it's it yeah. it reminds me it's like red with some gold and white kind of mm -hmm. reminds me of um, like orchids or something. No, yes. Yeah. 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 So this it's one horrible. is uh, Jennifer wanted this one. So I'm giving it to her and it's covered in gloss varnish. So and then all of the backs are covered and, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I've got a lot. I got a lot going on um, and I have two days to get it done. And <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'm actually staying put this weekend for the first time in a while. So I am excited to. Yay. Um, I'm sure to be doing stuff, but not leaving. I'm not flying to LA this weekend. I have been in LA the past two weekends. Yes. Visiting little Miss Macaroni so, and Cheese. I'm happy to stay. Yep. So I'm happy to stay home. In yeah. The ridiculous heat. Yeah, for sure. Um, be fun. How was your fourth? Did you guys light off any fireworks or anything? We did not. No, we um, we didn't really do much of anything. The weekend was really chill. Um, I did get uh, some painting done. Um, <laughs> paintings prepped. I don't know why I thought it was a brilliant idea to add something else to my plate, but I did. And so here I'm here I am. I'm making money from it. And I'm like, all right, let's keep doing this. So <laughs> We didn't do much of anything. Um, my dogs last night, basically, because I live in a, a subdivision and there's subdivisions around me. So everybody in all the subdivisions started lighting off their own fireworks starting at like eight o'clock before the sun was even down and went on till 1030 at night. So all three of my dogs were basically like, well, up your ass seems to be the safest place right now. So we're just going to follow <laughs> you and stick real close to you. Um, other than that, we, we didn't really do a whole lot. I did watch, um, for the first time and I really enjoyed it was Dr. Strange, Dr. Strange two, is it Dr. Strange two or just Dr. Strange multiverse of madness? Um, yeah, I think that's the second one. I don't know. That is the second one. I just couldn't remember if it was Dr. Strange two or just Dr. Strange. Um, anyway, it's really good. I recommend it. Um, so I, re I, you know little glass of wine and propped up in bed and i had the most fucked up dreams afterward though because like i mean as soon as it was done i immediately went to sleep and just had the most fucked up dreams but um it's a good movie i recommend it i'm a big fan of marvel so nice yeah yeah that's super fun how about well, you guys um i think i kind of told you earlier so oh yeah <laughs> i just had like a little pack of fireworks and so we went out front um <laughs> We did them in like the cul-de-sac kind of where my house is and they're you know like little fountains and stuff so that's what i was expecting because that's like all that's really legal in arizona sure um except i forgot that i bought this pack on the way back from texas <laughs> <laughs> and so all of a sudden i light it and stuff just starts flying out and it's like super loud and yeah Holy shit flying shit. everywhere I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Luckily, all my it. neighbors were lighting off stuff, so they didn't care. But it was, yeah, I was shocked because that was not what I was expecting at all. I just thought, oh, little fountains, you know, to be fine. Yeah. yeah. So, like, how high fountains. in the air did so they go? Crazy. Like, like uh, 50 feet. Okay. That's about what, what my neighbors had. They, I mean, like, they were, yeah. the houses here, like, some of them were three stories and they were very well clearing the roofs of the houses from, you know, like over there and over there. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. We didn't nope. even have a sparkler. Not a thing. But that's okay. That's yeah. okay. We And we don't go that's anywhere and nice do anything. Still. Yeah, you know, we just chilled, which was which was lovely and um, needed because I've been like on the go so much lately, and you know, um, I I don't actually think I've worked a full week of work in like a month because we had <laughs> more than a month actually because we had Trans Allegheny and then something else was going on and I was off one day and then oh Emma's graduation and. So it just happened with like holidays, Juneteenth and the fourth, like the way it's fallen. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've worked a full week of work in over a month. Stop bragging. I know. And meanwhile, I'm like, (laughs) I'm in so tired and stressed. Like I've needed these days off. (laughs) The fuck? Everybody can feel free to hate Carrie right now. I mean, kind of. Yes. So anyway, um, yeah. yeah. That's all I got. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's do this. Guys, we have a really cool location to tell you about. Um, Laura, why don't you tell them what we're talking about this week? We are going to the Morris Jumel Mansion in Manhattan. It is in Manhattan, right? Um, yes, I do believe so. Which, I mean, okay. looking at this picture, like, can you believe that's Manhattan? <laughs> no, and that's why I was like, wait. It is right because I, I wrote this a little while. <laughs> right, we've had these we've had this research done for a minute. Um, so anyway, all right, Laura, what are your sources? So my sources are morrisjamel.org, historichousetrust.org, wikipedia.org, thelittlehouseofhorrors.com, nycarchitecture.com, and saratoga.com. We. All right, weave me a tale. Tell me about the history of this place, because this is a good one. I really like it. I'm surprised we haven't done it yeah. before now, actually. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, tale, and it's yeah. really cool. It's the oldest surviving house in Manhattan. Whoa. Um, the Morris Jamel Mansion um, has borne witness to much of New York's rich and diverse history. It was built in 1765. Holy shit. For the Morris family. Right, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, for America, it's super old. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, the original property um, is located on the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. Mm-hmm. Lenape. Right, you are Lenape. Lenape, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, go Laura. Right. <laughs> Comprise, and it's, um, so, yeah, it was uh, 50 modern city blocks of land they had. Mo- oh, wow, that's, all right. Yeah, it's, that's some, you got some land? It's quite a bit, yeah. So... <laughs> So Roger Morris, um, he was a British military officer, and he built the house in 1765 for himself and his American-born wife, uh, Mary Phillips Morris. Um, It was called Mount Morris. Um, That was the original name of the mansion. Um, And it was also a working farm with fruit trees, cattle, and a variety of crops. Cool. Um, so, So during the decade before the Revolutionary War, this Georgian house with its monumental portico an octagonal drawing room was the oh. setting for some of the colony's most fashionable parties. Neat. Okay. Party time. Right. <laughs> right. So <laughs> as British loyalists, Morris went to England at the start of the war, um, while his wife and family went to stay in the Phillips estate in Yonkers. Um, Morris returned in 1777 after the city had been captured by the British he became the inspector of the claims of refugees until 1783 when he and his family left for England after the British defeat in the revolution. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So between September 14th and October 20th, 1776, um, General George Washington used the mansion as his temporary headquarters after yeah. his army was forced to evacuate Brooklyn Heights following their loss um, to the British army in the Battle of Long Island. Wow. Okay. No. Right. It's kind of, I think that we forget that. So a lot of the, this, the war was fought in New York. You know what I mean? Like, cause then you think, yeah. you don't think about people fighting in the middle of Manhattan or right. Long Island, right? Brooklyn. I don't remember a monument in Times Square. That's weird. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So the view from Mount Morris was perfect for observing troop movements. Um, mm. This advantage was used to plan his army's first successful victory on September 16th uh, during the Battle of Harlem Heights. Okay. So um, some people claim that Washington um, moved into the house because 
because of its location, but also because Mary um, Phillips had been a love interest for him like 20 years before then. Oh, oh, wow. All right. I didn't see that one coming. Wow. Poor Martha. Yeah, I know, kind of weird, huh? (laughs) So, I mean, there's no proof of that, but... Sure. You know. TMZ of the day said that this is what was going on. It is TMZ. We're TMZing it. So, so after Washington's retreat, um, British and Hessian commanders did occupy the house. Um, And it was one of the few buildings that housed military personnel from both sides of the conflict. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. So after the war, it was confiscated by the state of New York (laughs) and sold to cover war debts. Um, It was briefly used as a tavern and an inn. Neat. So in the summer of 1790, Washington returned to the mansion and dined with his um, future cabinet members and their wives. Oh, cool. So President George Washington and his wife, Martha, Vice President John Adams and his wife, Abigail, Thomas Jefferson, Eliza and Alexander Hamilton, and then along with, you know, numerous domestic staff and enslaved individuals who attended to the food and service elements of the dinner. Um, Shortly after that, the tavern closed and the mansion was abandoned once again. Hmm. Okay. Until 1810, um, wealthy French wine merchant Stephen Jamel and his American wife, Eliza, purchased the mansion. So I got to tell you guys about Eliza because I think that... Out of all the history, she is the most interesting person. She George is. See you later. Like, she's super I mean, interesting. So. She's really interesting, yeah. Let's take a look at yeah, her real quick, so actually. Was... Hang on. All right. Let's see. Isn't she lovely? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, for well, the day, she was yeah. probably a looker. Yeah. So she was born at the dawn of the revolution in 1775. Um, Eliza Jamel, she was formerly known as Betty Bowen. Uh, She spent most of her youth as an indentured servant in Mm. Providence, Rhode Island. Um, She lived in a brothel with her mother until the age of seven. Uh, I mean, same. She lived in a workhouse twice. (laughs) My mom's going to kill me when she she was 23, (laughs) right? Eliza had lost both of her parents and her older brother. Um, With nowhere left to turn, the young woman chose to reinvent herself completely, and she moved to the growing port city of New York. Changed her name to Eliza Brown and became a theater extra. extra. A theater Um, extra? So extra yeah cool so yeah right so eliza brown married the successful french wine merchant stephen jamel in 1804 Um, like eliza stephen had left his past behind him to forge a new life in new york however eliza's humble beginnings would follow the couple throughout their marriage uh leading to fierce accusations and rumors um you know as they do yeah I, i mean Haters, man. Haters. I'm on my fifth invented um, life, and I'll tell you, I got a lot of nasty <laughs> divorces behind me. Yikes. Yeah, that's what happens. All right, so in 1815, she and Stephen um, moved to Paris while there, Eliza would amass an incredible art collection and find acceptance from French aristocrats. Uh, their alignment would mark the Jamels as a Bonapartist sympathizers, and the accusations flew. After Napoleon's defeat in Waterloo, surviving legends suggested that Eliza had offered him safe passage to the United States. Um, So when she returned to New York on her own in 1817, um, it's probably due to homesickness, but um, it's rumored that she had been personally asked to leave France. (laughs) 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 Because of her Napoleon sympathies. Um, wow. Okay. So whatever the reason was, yeah, um, the departure seemed to have been a sudden one, uh, leaving Stephen Jamel scratching his head, quote, the ladies never dreamt that you would return to New York, and nor did I, end quote. Wow. Um, yeah, so upon her return, uh, she spared no expense refurbishing the mansion. Uh, in 1828, um, they returned with, from Paris with crates of furniture and paintings. Uh, Stephen and Eliza added new doorways and stained glass to the facade of the mansion. Ooh. And as regular visitors to France, they furnished much of the house in the French Empire style. Um, many of those objects, including a bed said to have belonged to the Emperor Napoleon, remain in the mansion today. So That's a clever really investor. cool. It is really cool, That's right? So, so there's cool. tons of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
So a clever investor and a businesswoman, Eliza had become one of the wealthiest women in New York City by 1830. Um, Stephen passed away unexpectedly in 1832. Uh, there are some theories about his death. Um, some claim he died of pneumonia. Mm. Others say he got seriously injured in a carriage accident. And there I are people who claim Eliza one. had something to do with his death. Um, yeah. And that version, Stephen fell off a hay cart onto a pitchfork. Ouch. I've heard this um, one, Eliza yeah. was said to have removed his ba bandages, so he bled to death. Yeah. Uh, nobody. Don't fall on a pitchfork. Not Ooh, right. I know. Yeah, I know. I mean, none of them are really so recommended, about... but. <laughs> no, absolutely not. So about 14 months after Stephen's death, she married former Vice President Aaron Burr. Ah, um, yes. Let's take a look at this lovely. Oh, no. Um, made his mark in history as the man who shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. Yep. Um, their union was a practical one. Uh, she wanted to increase her social standing and Burr wanted her money. So the marriage failed only four months later when she found out that he had been mismanaging her fortune. Yeah. Uh, like he had taken all the money and paid off his debts. <laughs> so I mean, he was a stand-up guy. Like yeah. For sure. Yeah. So she chose Alexander Hamilton Jr. as her divorce attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so this bitch is funny. I know. I love her. I was like, that is such a like. She is. Funny. Yeah. I love it. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. So her divorce divorce. I can't talk from Burr finalized on the day he died. Um, Eliza walked away with her entire fortune, including her beloved mansion in Manhattan. Good. Um, this home would also become the temporary residence of Anne Northup, the wife of the kidnapped farmer and mu musician Solomon Northup. Um, they did the movie 12 Years a Slave. Oh, okay. About him. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So one for one year um, when Solomon was held as a slave in Louisiana, Anne and her three children stayed and worked in the Manhattan mansion. Wow, that's uh, cool. I love this story. Yeah, there's just so much history so tied much. into this house. It's so cool. Like So many yeah, plot it's, twists, it's, too. It's pretty cool. Right? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, so when Eliza died in 1865, she left most of her money and her belongings to a local church and other charities, um, which pissed off her relatives. Um, they spent two decades fighting over her, her will. Oh, shit. Uh, and when they finally yeah, succeeded, they sold the land and the mansion to a syndicate of land developers. Um, and then after that, the mansion stood empty for years. But in the early 1900s, the building was transformed into a museum operated by the Washington's Headquarters Association, which was formed by four chapters of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Oh, cool. Uh, today, the mansion features restored period rooms from the Morris, Washington, and Jumel eras and exciting public programs that expand the limits of a traditional historic house museum. Yeah. Um, so... Um, the other cool thing is like during the middle of the 20th century, um, the neighborhood divided into a vibrant home to many artists and celebrities for the Harlem Renaissance, including like Paul Robeson, Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall and Duke Ellington, who once referred to the Morris Jamel mansion as the jewel in the crown of Sugar Hill. Wow. I know. I'm like, I love Duke Ellington. I... Um, so today, all right. So guess what? Mansion... I, we're going to New York. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> right. <laughs> so today, the mansion and neighboring buildings are part of the Jamel Terrace um, Historic District. Cool. And because of this, the appearance of the immediate neighborhood has changed very little since the beginning of the 20th century. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So I mean, you can walk right through history over here. Um, the mansion is now owned by the New York City Department of Parks and Rec, um, and it's a member of the Historic House Trust. Very cool. Um, also, because we were talking um, about it, one of the Hamiltons, or both. Uh, so Lynn manuel Miranda, I'm massacring his name, the guy who Lin wrote Hamilton. Lynn manuel um, Miranda, yeah. He actually wrote portions, thank you. He, I, I was pretty close. You were. He actually wrote portions of the musical at that mansion. I did read that in my part. Like, well, not in cool? my part, but when I was researching my part, I did read that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love yeah, him. Yeah, that's super cool. I love yeah, him. I have yes. not seen Hamilton. Have you seen it? Did we talk about this a minute ago? Yes. I haven't seen it. Mm, I've seen it. Yeah. 
Is it it's amazing? That's what I hear. I have not heard one awful thing about it. Not one bad thing and nothing about it. Um, but I have. It sells out almost as soon as tickets go on sale. So it's exceptionally difficult to get tickets yeah. to it. Um, but I really did, you know, as far as what I know him in, I really did enjoy him in Mary Poppins too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just a joy. So yeah, he is. Yeah, for sure. All right. So was that's that, the history. Oh, that was it. Oh, God, that was good. That was that's really it. good. Very good oh, job. Thank you. Yeah, this is a really cool Miss one. Miss Eliza makes it super fun. So, you know, that lady. I'm like, I want to be friends with you. <laughs> oh, right? She's the best. She's mm-hmm. one of the more prominent ghosts um, of the mansion. Um, and we will get to my part here in just a second. Um, and for you guys, it's just going to be a blip of time. But we will be right back in like right now. <laughs> See, guys, that didn't take too long at all. In reality, it was three hours, but... (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, let's talk about some ghosts. Here are my sources. They're tiny because they're long. Uh, CBSnews.com, boroughsofthedead.com, lampumsquarterly.org. It's an article by Sarah Laskow that I found really cool. Ghostsofnewyork.com, newyorktimes.com, corporate.discovery.com, and... The Holes Are Files, episode called They Buried Me Alive. So, I know. Hold on, my button's not working. Just a sec. Uh Uh-oh, hold on. Something happened. I did something I shouldn't have. Okay, there. All right, so... The Morris Jamel Mansion is considered one of the most haunted places in New York City. Uh, it has been the subject of paranormal investigations on television shows like The Holzer Files and Ghost Adventures, and has also been featured on The Today Show. Famous paranormal academics and investigators such as Hans Holzer and the Tennessee Wraith Chasers, who I love, um, have all visited the site to try and communicate with the former residents. People have claimed to see apparitions of all sorts in the mansion, from Hessian soldiers to George Washington to Eliza Jamel to Aaron Burr. Now, um, a paranormal investigator by the name of Vincent Carbone, and I talk about him quite a bit in my portion. Um, He also gives tours at the mansion. He said that if there are such a thing as ghosts, they are here. Uh, For decades, most of the mansion's past, including its ghosts, was left to languish, as Laura had mentioned, uh, while the curators focused on the few weeks that Washington had actually spent there. So there was some worry, too, that the ghost stories might goad leery, superstitious neighbors to attack the house. And I will get... The neighbors did have an issue, and I will talk about that a little bit later, but um, now there are regular paranormal investigations uh, inside the historic location in which, you know, small groups of people are, you know, like me and Laura, and they go into these places and they try to communicate with the mansion's phantom residents. So a few years ago, Carbone happened to call Morris Jamel and to inquire about a ghost hunt for a bachelor party of a friend and fellow investigator right when the mansion happened to be in need of a ghost hunter. So ghosts can bring in guests who otherwise might not be inclined to join a historic tour. Um, Mm -hmm. And it does create a new source of income for a location, right? Um, Especially sites that are struggling to stay open or sites that are trying to earn money to restore the location. Um, so since Carbone started working at Morris Jamel full time at the start of 2016, the mansion has hosted sold out public paranormal investigations about once a month. Um, wow. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, he did say, I haven't seen much, but I have heard disembodied voices, footsteps. I've heard objects moving. Other staff members have seen things. They have heard things as well, including activity in Aaron Burr's former bedroom. So EMF um, detectors, when they're brought into Burr's bedroom, um, they will go off. And Carbone says, quote, this furniture is original. This is from France. Uh, I mean, like you were just saying, uh, Eliza right. Jamel 
um, did own this. There's nothing electronic in, around, or underneath these pieces of furniture. So it's pretty curious that EMF detectors would light up in this room that has pretty much no technology in it. Right. Yeah. So... One so group. are they saying it like if you put it on the bed it lights up or just like mm-hmm. yeah like, all in the room like the whole room um kind of the everywhere room. in the room yeah so oh, this okay. one group had put the EMF detectors um on two chairs in the room and they lit up to red now wow yeah so i actually have an EMF detector here and i'll turn it on so you can see the green light over here and then like the stronger the the EMF field that it's detecting will light up to like all the way to red. So there's like green, there's a darker green, yellow, orange and red. And the, this thing is lighting up all the way to red. That's kind of rare. I have yet to be on an investigation where this is just lighting up red consistently. Orange maybe, oh, sure. but yeah, so it's pretty interesting. I found that um, I found that to be really quite interesting that they placed it on two chairs, lit up all the way to red. Carbone says, quote, I'm not saying that we are definitely capturing a ghost conversation here, but it is pretty interesting and it opens up the dialogue a little bit more. And honestly, I could not agree more. Um, no, Carol. Can you imagine? I mean, if that stuff was owned by Napoleon, too, like all the kind of. Oh, hey, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where the bed supposedly is from. So that's pretty. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know what? We'll we'll get into that idea a little bit later. So Carol Ward, who is the executive director of the mansion, um, noted that there are trends that there tend to be more activity during events or renovations. And we have talked about that kind of thing a lot on this show where uh, re- um, any kind of construction, any kind of renovation, any kind of disturbance or change or upheaval to a structure or inside a building does tend to kick up the paranormal activity. And Morris Chabelle Mansion is no different. Um, she had said that um, the portraits, uh, it, this one uh, renovation that they were doing, portraits had been moved off the walls. And um, she also said that there tends to be more paranormal activity when she is around. She's been working at the mansion for eight years. She's the first female executive director of the mansion. And many believe that Eliza had feminist leanings considering the way that she managed to expand Stephen Jamel's fortune and hang on to it in spite of being a woman during the late 1700s, early 1800s. That's pretty phenomenal. So, And if she threw her husband on a pitchfork, I mean, come on. (laughs) Exactly. Well, that's the other thing, too. Um, And if you guys have seen the, the episode on the Morris Jamel Mansion of the Holzer Files, you know what I'm talking about or what I'm going to talk about, but I talk a little bit about that, like conspiracy theory kind of thing surrounding Mm -hmm. his death. So there have been other recent investigations at the mansion by outside groups, but they found little activity. So when Carol was talking about some of her experiences in the mansion, um, for example, she said that there was a television crew that was visiting the mansion and Carol heard a voice ask if everything was OK, but she could find no one in the vicinity when the crew was filming in another area. Um, so during this renovation where like paintings and portraits had been moved, again, more things, sounds, uh, whispers, EMS detectors going off, like you're disturbing their home, the ghost's home, their, their spirit's home, essentially. So it stands to reason that they're probably going to be like, hey, what the hell is going on? Um, she also said um, in a little bit more history um, of the mansion, she was talking to a group. They had distinctly heard footsteps coming from the second floor when nobody was on the second floor. So Vincent Carbone was with her during this talk with this group, he started to notice that activity on the EMF uh, were going off again, 
near where Eliza married Aaron Burr. So I guess they got married in the mansion. So in that area, EMF detectors started going off. Um, Lights moving from orange to red. And like I said, that's pretty high EMF field. You can typically get it when you put it up next to a power outlet or any like my ring light here or my computer, anything that's kicking off like electricity, it's going to set one of these off. Um, the fact that it's not anywhere near electricity, that's, that's pretty interesting. I find that pretty interesting and it's gotta be pretty close to it. Like it's not on right now, but like my phone has to be almost right touching it for this to go off. Um, so even if it's just kind of like three, four feet away, it's not going to set one of these off, which is another reason why I like these. Um, it's not as easy to debunk it when it goes off when there's no kind of electrical source near it. So, um, one of the more famous incidents that happened at the mansion involved a group of school children who were there on a field trip and they were waiting to get into the mansion. Um, they had arrived with their teachers and the um, tour guide hadn't opened up the mansion yet. The tour guide was the only person in the building at the time getting things ready for the group of kids when an elderly woman came out onto the second floor balcony and told them to be quiet, that her husband was ill and he was asleep and they needed to be quiet, basically shushed them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> when the tour guide uh, showed up to let the children in, they asked about the woman on the second floor. No one should be in the mansion right now, the tour guide had said. So as they were going on their tour, the children saw Eliza's portrait and this is the portrait that they saw. Hang on, let me find that. Do, 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 do. As soon as they saw this portrait, they told the staff and their teachers that, that that was the woman they saw on the second floor balcony that shushed them. And even the teachers saw her, saw this woman. She came right out on the balcony and told the kids, you need to be quiet. My husband is ill and is asleep. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Oh, I said, that's awesome. That's such a good story. I know. I love it. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, especially when it's not just one or two kids. Eh, maybe you're seeing right. things. Maybe you're making it up. But a whole class and the teachers are like, no, we saw this chick. And then to be, point her out in a painting. I thought that was really, really cool. Exactly. That's one of my, yeah. yeah, it's one of my favorite um, stories. So, Laura, as you had mentioned, Eliza was a revolutionary woman for her time, a very sharp business person who started life in the lowest tier of American society. And she kind of courted controversy as she climbed to the top. But her posthumous reputation suffered even more. It was said that she had killed her husband for his money, Stephen Jamel. And after her own death, her ghost wouldn't leave the house. So... She herself had claimed that the place was already haunted when her husband bought it in 1810. So like you mentioned, it was built by Colonel Roger Morish, a British loyalist and commandeered as George Washington's headquarters during the Revolutionary War. Um, the building had quartered Hessian mercenaries before briefly becoming a tavern in 1789. Now, a century and a half after she died, Eliza's ghost is supposed to linger here still shushing school children. <laughs> um, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, the management resisted ghost hunters for a long time after the mansion became a museum in 1904. On occasion, though, visitors would report an encounter with Eliza or a Hessian soldier that was rumored to have died on the stairs or a maid that had jumped out of a window. So the house had a long enough history to have accumulated a kind of a cast of ghosts um, and some of them quite famous. George Washington, him, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> George Washington himself was said to pace the floors. Um, some felt the presence of the man Eliza married after her first husband died, former Vice President Aaron Burr. And this is one of the best things about Eliza Jamal that in your telling of it, in my research of her, 
This is one of the best things. She took to calling herself the vice queen of the United States of America when she was married to Aaron. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I can't believe I didn't. I, I must have swapped that out. Yes. I was glad you did it because I was like, yes, now I get to say it. Um, yes. The vice queen of the United States of America. And after I wrote this in my notes, I wrote ludicrous. Um, because as we all know, we are the United States of America to get, because we wanted to get away from the monarchy. Uh, we do not have a vice queen of anything. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But I, I loved mean, but it. Maybe I'll volunteer. I volunteer as tribute. As tribute. Okay. You are the vice queen of You're... the podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> me being it. me being the president queen <laughs> of the podcast. President queen. The president queen and the vice president queen. Um, anyway, I thought that was super funny. I was like, this is the best piece of really information freaking ever. Yeah. Um, she sounds like such a crazy character. Doesn't she, though? I mean, mm. oh, yeah, yeah. So one night, Vinny um, and Carol... Uh, wanted to try an experiment. And Carol had noted in previous investigations that when there were a lot of men present, they get very little activity in Eliza's bedroom. So Carol wanted to split, split the group up so only women would investigate her bedroom. And then they would switch to all men. It was interesting that the EMF detectors were extremely active in Eliza's bedroom when a group of women huddled around her bed asking her questions as, do you consider yourself a feminist? Are you happy to see so many people visiting this room? Now, when the group switched to men, um, they detected no activity in Eliza's bedroom the entire time they were in it. Wow. Yeah. I feel like that's what your ghost would do. All the women are here. <laughs> Yay. And then the men come in and you're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going to go on my no, balcony and shush kids. I have my kids. boys, though. Yeah. I'm like, I'm all, I love my boys. I have my boys. Right. As long as they are children or cats, you're good. Okay. <laughs> so down in the basement um, where the kitchen is actually based, um, not a lot of the same night, not a lot of activity was going on with the exception of the motion detector lights, which were placed by the stairs. And that's just what the house has as part of like a security measure. Um, plus also uh -huh. a safety measure because it's in the fucking basement. Um, so during this night, nobody was sitting or standing anywhere near the stairs, but the lights kept going off as though someone were walking up and down the stairwell. So kind of like oh, weird. in order and then down. It was, mm -hmm. yeah, really cool. Also kind of creepy. And I was hoping somebody had caught video of it and I couldn't find any, but. Uh -huh. Oh, if, that's super creepy though. That's super creepy. I mean, right? if you were watching it, that'd be real fucking weird. A thousand percent. Yeah. Um, the closest thing that I had ever come to was when we were at Trans Allegheny the first time, um, we watched a shadow at the end of the exit of the third floor, the violent men's ward. We were standing right outside of Dean's room and we watched this shadow walk by and block out the light down there. And we were just, it, it, it's very hard to register something like that in your head because you're like, what is causing that? It's a tree. It's no, no trees over there. Oh, okay. It's, you know, you're trying to figure out a logical reason for it. it. Exactly. But lights going, motion detector lights going up the stairs and then back. I can't. I have no explanation for that. None. Um, yeah. This basement kitchen is not the greatest uh, as far as like activity and just an overall creepy vibe. Um, <clears throat> Carol had told this group about the time that she and another staff member were upstairs in the gift shop and distinctly heard the scraping of the table legs followed by laughter in the basement. Uh, no one was supposed to be in the mansion at the time. They both looked at each other, you know, a little anxiously, uh, and they ran downstairs to find out who was there. They searched thoroughly, but couldn't find a single person. The basement door was including the additionally the basement door was locked when they got down there they had to unlock it to get in the room but they could hear laughter and furniture moving a whole thing right 
They had so no like exp- a whole party going on. Kind of, yeah. And they had no explanation for who or what was making those sounds. So Eliza is allegedly seen wandering about the property in a white dress and um, producing ki- some kind of creepy noises, sighs, whispers, muttering. Um, once when a psychic went to the mansion and purportedly summoned the spirit of Stephen Jamel, the spirit had said that he was murdered and buried alive. Um, the, the psychic was a, a co, not co, I don't want to say co-worker, but uh, Hans Holzer often investigated with psychic mediums. Mm-hmm. And this woman was, was one of the ones that he, he did that with. So she had gone there and she had channeled the spirit of Stephen Jamel and he had said, they buried me alive. Um, which is the title of the Holzer Files episode on this location. Um, Hans Holzer himself held two seances there in 1965, but heard nothing from Eliza. Uh, Holzer claimed that her first husband, Stephen Jamel, complained about her during the seance. (laughs) (laughs) So the Holzer Files is a fabulous show. Have you ever seen it? Um, I think maybe once. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really unique, yeah, it's a really unique show. I really like it. Um, It stars Dave Schrader, Shane Pittman, and psychic medium Cindy Kaza. So basically what it does is it reopens the case files of America's first ghost haunter, Hans Holzer, um, revealing original recordings and documents from the paranormal pioneers' renowned studies. The Holzer Files, um, like I said, dedicated paranormal team led by investigator Dave Schrader, psychic medium Cindy Kaza, equipment tech Shane Pittman. And they, reve- they reveal, nope, they revisit Holzer's um, most captivating cases. So with the help of um, Hans Holzer's daughter, Alexandra Holzer, and researcher Gabe Roth, the team kind of picks up where Hans Holzer left off in these investigations to re-examine mm-hmm. some of these hauntings. So, oh, cool. yeah, um, Hans Holzer is recognized as the father of the paranormal. Um, he did have a four-decade long career exploring disturbing hauntings like the An- Amityville Horror House, Horror House, not the Amityville Horror House. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you might have went there too. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe. Maybe um, you did an investigation. You don't know. I mean, let's not judge. Uh, <laughs> an investigation. Um, <laughs> so, because of all of this, that he, the work that he's done, and, and the the foundation that he's laid for folks like you and me, um, mm-hmm. it it kind of helped spawn legions of supernatural enthusiasts more than he wrote more than 120 books. And I thought this was really cool. He even inspired Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis to write Ghostbusters. (laughs) Yes. Yes. That is the best. That is the best. So, um, it's, it's a really fascinating show. They do use his notes, his recordings, his video that he shot in all of these locations. And in this one, when he came to investigate the Morris Jamel mansion in 1964, employees told him that they were terrified because they had been encountering apparitions in the home. Uh, past occupants roaming the property, heard whispering in the empty halls. So... Even though um, Holzer and the psychic medium Ethel Myers were able to communicate with Stephen Jamel and help his restless spirit move on, Jamel's wife Eliza refused to leave and has actually remained a haunting presence in the home to this day. So in recent years, however, a darker entity has emerged that has concerned employees reaching out for help again. And that's when Dave Schrader, Cindy, Shane, that's when they go back. So the episode of Holzer Files is really fantastic. Their investigation in the mansion results in numerous EMF hits, including intelligent responses to questions um, uh, like Eliza saying, get out of my room repeatedly through Cindy. Cindy Kaza, um, she does automatic writing. And in her automatic writing, Eliza just keeps saying, get out of my room, get out of my room, get out of my room. Um, there were anomalies detected with the SLS camera, total camera 
equipment failure, um, batteries dying. Shane was seeing shadows and hearing footsteps all around him when down in the basement kitchen area where the motion detector lights were going off. Um, yeah. He heard the words get out come over the walkie talkie earpiece he was wearing. And it wasn't. Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't Dave or Cindy or the producer. It mm-hmm. was creepy. Um, visitors often claim to see a drunken Hessian soldier on the staircase, Eliza Jamel um, wandering through the hallways at night, and her two former husbands quarreling in the cellar have been also claims that people have seen, <laughs> which I think is funny. That's funny. Mm-hmm. That is funny. Yeah. Um, the One of the curators decided to hold a seance in Eliza Jamel's bedroom one night, complete with a radio broadcast. Mm-hmm. So they were doing it live, kind of like a live podcast episode. They got such mm-hmm. foul language come through during the seance that they had to be cut off the air. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. That's awesome, though. I know, right? Um, so employees of the mansion have said that they have seen people, some of the neighbors, and you had talked about the neighborhood briefly and what it looks like now. Mm-hmm. So some of the neighbors in the area um, are not a big fan of the spirits that are haunting this particular home. And employees have said that they have actually seen and run off people from the property that were performing Santeria rituals in front of the mansion. Um, it believed to do, be done in an effort to rid the house of spirits and to protect it. So the Holzer Files team believes that these um, individuals that are performing these rituals inadvertently opened a portal that allowed other less friendly spirits in because the the activity has gotten darker as the years have gone by. So, um, Mm -hmm. and since Hans Holzer had been there. So through like talking with employees, talking with some of the local historians and some of the neighbors, they kind of figured out that this is what is going on, especially when the employees were like, we've had to run these people off the property. They're performing these rituals and kind of casting spells. And so it's believed that they were in They inadvertently opened a portal. Um, that allowed I mean, some darker stuff in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was just doing it a minute ago. Um, like, I just killed a chicken. I don't, like, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Right? This, this, what? This is totally white magic. Um, no, I'm not, and I'm not trying to, like, disparage the Santeria religion, but this is what the belief is among the staff um, and some of the investigators that have, have been there. That um, mm-hmm. they have inadvertently opened that portal. Um which I want to circle back to what you were saying about Napoleon's bed being in her room. Maybe he, I mean, maybe he is there too. Like once you open up a portal like that and it just kind of becomes this like gateway into letting other spirits into the location. Um, I know that the Stanley hotel has one such, um, and it's called the vortex, which is kind of like a, paranormal super highway at the, the mm-hmm. bay top landing of the Stanley hotel where spirits can just kind of come and go and, you know, um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe that is the case that they've opened something there. That's just sort of. Not well, there were a lot of soldiers that probably went in and out of there. And like you said, there were Hessian missionary, uh, not missionaries, missionaries, missionaries. <laughs> <It's mercenaries. laughs> <laughs> Very different. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, all of these people seeing, you know, action in war and mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah. It's like super dark stuff. Super dark energy. So Super, super dark energy. Um, mm-hmm. Vincent Carbone says, quote, people come here and say, George, is that you? Eliza, is that you? You don't know what happened here. You could be saying, Eliza, is that you? And meanwhile, you've got 100 other ghosts in the room saying, hey, what about me? Mm -hmm. That's quite an opening, you know? So that's what I have on the ghosts of the Morris Jumel mansion. If you guys want to go and see it, and I highly recommend that you do, at some point, Laura and I will try to get up there as well. You can visit... um, 
their website to find out all about their tours, when they're open, all of that good stuff at morrisjamel.org. It is located at 65 Jamel Terrace, New York, New York, 10032. You can call them for more information at 212-923-8008 or email them at morrisjamel, info at morrisjamel.org. And that is the Morris Jamel Mansion. That was a great job on the ghosts. There's Thanks. some really excited i'd love to go i know could you imagine going and like seeing george washington pacing a room i'd be like uh holy crap or even some lady shushing me like i'm (laughs) I'm here for you eliza (laughs) right yeah i think i'd most like like her because she just sounds awesome she she does unless she did uh kill her husband by taking off his bandages and then burying him alive in which case she's not that great feminist or not yeah there's some questionable behavior yeah i mean yeah <laughs> well, we don't bit. know that that's true you know they always love to make successful women out to be villains too mm-hmm. right so yeah yeah like oh she's terrible so yeah yeah i say no i say she's great yeah so so anyway that's uh that's that's what i got that's that's all i got guys i don't have any i said all of my big doings all your stuff in the beginning so i don't have anything else so laura do you have anything else to close us out i do not no all right well why don't you let everybody know where they can find us oh no all righty it's not working hold please hold the button doesn't work oh there we go okay uh so you can find us on instagram facebook and twitter at hoah podcast and you can follow us on the TikTok as well at HOAH Podcast, at HOAH Carrie, and at HOAH Co host Laura. You certainly can. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, YouTubers, thank you. for watching us. And we hope you have a really wonderful week. We have a brand new Monday Morning Weird Story coming at you on Monday. We hope you tune in for that. Um, and. To that end, we say, stay safe out there because you never know who or what is listening. Listening. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. (laughs) Wait, I don't have my button to end it. Okay, there we go. Bye, guys. (laughs) (laughs) Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I mean, yeah. (laughs) All right. No, seriously. Bye.